Okay, hello everyone. Hello and welcome. Uh, thank you so much for choosing to spend, I'm sure some of you on the East Coast, your lunch hour with us. Uh, this is actually our first ever webinar. So uh, we're very excited to have uh, all of you in attendance and uh, we think that the topic is uh, pretty exciting ourselves as well. So uh, thank you for choosing to be here. Uh, we do hope to have you, uh, all of you in and out within the hour. So uh, we will try to run a type tight orderly ship today and uh, we will be holding some of your questions at the end so uh, hopefully you do see a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen in the in the zoom link and uh, you should be able to type questions throughout and uh, we will be getting to those at the very end with the the time that we have left so just as things come up feel free to enter them in. And uh, yeah, we will also be sending a recording of this uh, to each of you at the end of today or tomorrow so that you will have that to look over or share with any colleagues. And yeah, so uh, once again, thank you so much. So uh, without further ado, uh, we'll introduce the topic at which we will be discussing today, uh, which is the future has come early. Uh, providing remote health care for injured workers during COVID-19 and beyond. So this is a topic that I myself, uh, I should introduce myself, uh, I'm Grace McClure, Director of Marketing at Peerwell. Uh, so this is something that uh, the Peerwell team has discussed a lot now and uh, after COVID-19. So uh, certainly it's something that we have uh, been especially thinking about in the last couple of months and we're excited to share this topic with each of you. Um, and today we have two excellent speakers uh, of course, we have Manish Shah, who is the CEO of Peerwell. Uh, for those of you that may need a little bit of context on what Peerwell is, Peerwell is a musculoskeletal recovery platform that lets patients and injured workers recover from home with the devices they already own. And we also have Karen Thomas. Uh, very excited to have Karen. <laughs> Karen is the Director of Case Management Innovation at Corvell Corporation, and Karen is such a true expert in the workers' compensation space. She not only has 30 years of clinical experience as a nurse specialist, uh, she now serves at the executive level with a focus on innovation in case management. So I don't know if you guys want to say hello. I think you're on the screen. Hello. Thanks for hello. Ha having me. <laughs> Mm. Hello. Yes, Karen is a bit of a, a, a celebrity, a high demand speaker <laughs> in the, the webinar space. So uh, we're lucky to have snagged her. So uh, yes, thanks to you both for being here today. And I'll just walk us through the agenda. So what uh, all of you can expect uh, during our next hour together. So uh, we will be chatting through the future has come early. What does this mean? What does this mean to healthcare? Uh, we will then be discussing why telemedicine is here to stay. So alert. We don't think it's just a phase. Um, and then we will be discussing kind of building on the, me the momentum of telemedicine. So what comes next? Now that we've arrived here, what, it, what, what does the future hold? And then we'll also be having a candid discussion with Karen Thomas, uh, discussing innovation and in the workers' compensation space post-COVID-19. And uh, then we'll open it up to some questions from all of you in our last 10 or 15 minutes. So uh, I will uh, jump right into it and uh, I'll start uh, speaking with Manish. All right. Excellent. So uh, Manish, I think just to kick it off, uh, when talking about healthcare, what do we mean by the future has come early? Awesome. Thank you, Grace. And uh, just before we get into it, I want to thank everybody for, for joining us today. I think it's, uh, it's a special time that we're all in and it's exciting to be able to connect with all of you um, and share a little bit of, about what we think about uh, with the future and healthcare and everything that's happening. So when we think about the future of healthcare delivery and what's impacted by this pandemic, uh, you know, we've got to take a step back and think about, you know, in healthcare, the pace of change is not normally one that people would consider fast or cutting edge or uh, uh, doing things um, very differently. Um, but what we've seen as a result of this, uh, this pandemic over the last few months has been the entire delivery infrastructure of healthcare has, has been shifted. And uh, it's pushed the whole system to think differently about how can healthcare be delivered to those individuals that are sheltering in place, practicing social distancing, and unable to go in to the clinic or to the hospital or to urgent care centers, thankfully to give time to those frontline workers to provide care to those that are affected by the virus. So. Uh, as a result of that uh, complete shift, uh, we've seen 
uh, orders of magnitude differences in the adoption and use of telemedicine and remote care technologies. That's uh, something that we thought would take place over the course of 10 years has happened in, in a few months. And that's, uh, that's kind of what we think about when we say the future of, of healthcare has come early. Great. And uh, how has regulation, how have we seen regulation around telemedicine change uh, since COVID-19? I think this is the most important point. We, I do think we have to give a lot of credit to CMS and to regulators to uh, act quickly, to remove a lot of the existing impediments, to allow both providers and patients to uh, engage in a new way of, of receiving care. And a lot of this has been um, uh, allowing both providers, provider systems, patients to use technologies that have already been created and in place in new ways. So uh, being able to have a first visit with the patient over a telehealth um, visit, uh, being able to uh, spend more frequent time uh, over uh, telehealth video visits with patients, not having the same restrictions around uh, geographic distance between those uh, those two individuals uh, and creating parity between the in-person face-to-face visits uh, compared to the telehealth video visits and also removing a lot of the natural um, risks or sorry not natural but uh, the uh, issues around which technologies to even adopt right uh, actually allowing providers to use whichever technology is most convenient to them but also what's most convenient to the patient. And that's, uh, that's what's allowing the adoption of telemedicine to, to proliferate and to use uh, these technologies in, in novel ways to make sure that patients are receiving high quality care. Right, absolutely. And I think that as a group of healthcare professionals, we can uh, likely all say that the adoption of telemedicine has been slow. So uh, how have you seen this change and kind of what changes are you seeing in the level of increase in the desire for virtual care and the adoption of telemedicine? So, uh, I mean, initially, a lot of the, the change has, has been somewhat forced, right? Let's be honest. Uh, uh, overnight, there's been a, a shift in how healthcare can be delivered. Uh, but the, the remarkable thing is how, how massively we've seen the adoptions, adoption rates grow. So for example, in, uh, uh, in telemedicine or just general like regular video visits, uh, adoption rates were typically around eight to 10%. This is what you could see from companies like Teladoc and American Well in their annual reporting. Uh, just utilization was always a, a, a a high barrier. Uh, and now they're reporting orders of magnitude differences in use of telemedicine. Uh, their platforms are growing by, you know, several hundreds of percent uh, quarter over quarter. And even when I speak to medical leaders in, uh, in and around the, the Bay Area where I live, but also in other parts of the country and, and across North America, the adoption of telemedicine and um, video visits, patient portals has been dramatic. They're seeing uh, in some systems 900% increases. I've seen other systems show 2,500% increases in utilization of these uh, technology-based uh, care delivery mechanisms. And that's only video visits. When we talk about the use of remote monitoring uh, technologies, remote care options to help on patients while they're at home, uh, those are also seeing dramatic increases in, uh, in demand. Absolutely. So in, in talking about the adoption and the increase in demand, uh, why do we think that telemedicine is here to stay after COVID-19? Uh, so this is a great question. I think uh, what we're seeing is uh, people being forced into this new way of uh, engaging between providers, patients, and even providers uh, to each other. Uh, what they're witnessing for the first time, because they're kind of forced to, is first of all, it's, it's just much more convenient. Uh, you don't have to uh, bring yourself physically from one place to another, uh, like because it's not available to do that. But uh, for those that have the uh, uh, technology at home, they can easily just 
log on and set up a visit with their primary care provider or their specialist um, even to have a, a conversation about what's going on. Um, and that I think that convenience is going to uh, be felt by all parties. Um, secondly, what we learned is that uh, this isn't the first time people have uh, kind of been part of an outbreak. I, so I spoke directly with a, uh, a medical leader out of North America, out of Toronto even, and they said during the SARS outbreak that happened in their area, it took two years for patients to feel comfortable going back to the hospital. And this pandemic that we're all uh, living through right now is at a much bigger scale. So I believe that that's going to last. Uh, people are going to feel hesitant to take themselves to an er emergency room, urgent care center, uh, a clinic, hospital, even the medical office to, uh, to have a, uh, a visit with their provider. And when they can do it more conveniently from home, uh, I think it's definitely going to change their, um, uh, their behavior in that sense. Uh, the other kind of uh, element that we're witnessing here is that the technologies have gotten much better since uh, the early days of telehealth and telemedicine technology, right? Tele like video visits and things like that have been around for 20 years, uh, but things have changed dramatically in the uh, technology aspect so that we can deliver high quality care to patients, uh, regardless of what geography they're in or the distance between them and their provider. Uh, and this means like higher bandwidth um, video visits so you can have high, higher fidelity conversations, but it also means things like uh, the use of remote care technologies to truly understand the status of the patient as they're uh, going through treatment uh, remotely from their provider. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not the same as physically being in front of your provider where they can put their hands on you, but there are other means by which the provider can understand more fully how the patient is doing. Where are they struggling? Where can, they, where can we help them get past this issue in their, um, in their uh, scope of treatment? Uh, another aspect that I think is, uh, is definitely something that we need to pay attention to is the accessibility factor of this, right? Uh, and this is kind of separate from what we mean by convenience. So for example, my mom lives 50 miles outside of San Francisco and if there's a specialist that she needs to see that may only be in San Francisco, it's the closest metropolitan area for her to, uh, to get to, it's still 50 miles for her to travel. And she's not comfortable driving to, uh, to that specialist's office, uh, but she does have um, a computer at home. She uses you know, WhatsApp to, to chat with me and my son uh, regularly. So now, that specialist for whom she would normally have to travel hours to get to, get to can be accessible to her uh, from her own home. And I think that's, that's, that's very important. And then finally, I think all of this is leading to uh, just dramatic behavior change on both the provider side and the patient side. Patients are starting to get acclimated to this new way of uh, communicating with their providers or with their team of providers. Uh, and then providers themselves are uh, getting acclimated to this new way of uh, delivering care to their patients and making sure that their patients are receiving uh, the best that they can, they can get. Right, so I think that in looking at these factors, there, there are quite a few things at play that really make telemedicine a permanent fixture. So I know that this leads us into uh, the thing that uh, at Peerwell I know we're most excited about, which is the next phase. So what, uh, what does it look like and how do we plan or how can we build on the telemedicine momentum to do even more? Right, and that's, that's I think what is most exciting for, for all of us that you know, care about how healthcare is going to be delivered uh, going into the future. As we said, uh, much of the technologies that are being adopted and, and uh, much higher rates today have been technologies that have been built over the last 10 or 15 years. So uh, there's a lot that's being done to now activate this kind of latent infrastructure that's been around, but there's new things that uh, we can do 
in this new paradigm of healthcare delivery. Uh, first of all, we think about uh, in the normal uh, situation or pre-pandemic, patients would maybe go to their primary care doctor or their uh, specialist maybe once every six months, uh, unless there was something more uh, dramatic happening. Um, but even then, they're visiting them maybe once every month or once every three weeks. Um, and still, the challenge is, what do you do for that patient in between those visits? Now, with um, a telemedicine um, forward approach, those visits might happen more frequently. You might be logging in and talking to your provider once a week, um, even. And that frequency is great, but still the question remains, how can we help that person in between those visits? Not just the patient, but also their provider to understand, here's what we discussed last time, and these are the things that you need to work on so that in our next conversation, we can pick up from there and we can understand what the difficulties were or where we go next. So you can truly look at progressing the care across se several visits because they're happening more frequently. And I think there's ways to, uh, to give patients tangible takeaways to uh, kind of follow along with that care path that's being provided to them by their provider. Uh, another element, and I think this is probably the, one of the most important elements here. Uh, when I think about you know, me being sick uh, or having an issue, an injury, uh, I take myself to a provider. I'll go to the emergency room or an urgent care center or to the hospital. And in some ways, I, that's, that's my role. I'm taking myself to then receive care and I'm handing myself over to the providers to, to fix me. Uh, in this environment, you're not actually able to physically take yourself to the place uh, where care is delivered. It's actually where you are. And what we believe is uh, going to take place is the patients themselves become more, will become more active participants in the care delivery system. They have to do the work from home because nobody else is just going to come in and fix them. So uh, allowing patients and making it easier for patients to become active participants, making sure they're more literate in what's happening to them across all the different providers, making sure they have the right uh, activities to perform from home, uh, bringing those things down to make it easier for them to be an active participant is, is a complete change in uh, the kind of the mindset of the patient. And I think that'll also create dramatic shifts in, uh, in how healthcare is, is performed and valued. Um, and then finally, because of this uh, remote nature uh, and these more frequent visits that patients are having between them and their care teams, uh, there's an opportunity here to approach care in a multidisciplinary fashion, right? If I go to see my specialist, my orthopedic surgeon, I might only get advice related to uh, a physical injury, some exercises that I can do or some other intervention. But it's hard that in that uh, paradigm to think about what other aspects should I be working on? Nutrition, uh, mental health. Uh, these are equally important uh, for patients to, to adopt. And I think in this more higher frequency uh, remote model, you can touch upon a lot more things and truly provide an evidence-based multidisciplinary or comprehensive approach to addressing the, the need of the patient. Right, absolutely. And I think that um, in talking about all these factors, if we were just to crystallize and, and paint a picture for everybody, uh, what uh, if we take the example of the typical Purewell patient, which is somebody with a musculoskeletal condition or injury, uh, what does this telemedicine, this new telemedicine, a remote monitoring setup look like for them? Right. And I think that's, uh, uh, it's something that we spend a lot of time thinking about. And, you know, we as a team spoke about this just as this pandemic was taking, uh, taking root in society. And we thought about you know, what is our role? But what is going on with the patients that we seek to help? And that was, um, it was enlightening for us, actually, because when you think about the musculoskeletal patient, they're in pain, right? It's from an injury or it's from some other degenerative condition, and they're in pain. That pain doesn't stop when 
the pandemic hits and people need to practice social distancing. So what can we do to help that person uh, get through that and progress through their recovery? So uh, the opportunity that we saw was, well, a person that's injured might now uh, need to, or they might not be able to go to see their regular provider or their specialist. So what can they be doing uh, at home? What activities can they be doing to uh, continue their recovery uh, using their own kind of devices, everything that's around them, uh, because they might not have access to other things. So what uh, like physical therapy should they be doing from home? Uh, how, should be the, how should they be adapting their diet to uh, uh, improve the effects of that uh, physical therapy? Um, how can they be practicing mental health, uh, healthier practices around mental health, because uh, we're all dealing with a lot of pressure these days. Um, the pandemic weighs on people in, in new ways that uh, I think we're all still just learning how to, how to be with, you know? Uh, and what can the person do to help ease some of that? Because it definitely exacerbates the pain that they're feeling um, uh, when they're stuck at home and feeling isolated. So. Uh, when we think about that patient that's dealing with the musculoskeletal issue, it's about how can we help this person physically uh, do the activity that will continue the recovery? How can they adapt their other behaviors to uh, influence their um, uh, recovery? And then also, how can they track their progress to understand if they're uh, making progress at all, right? So this means, uh, are they completing the activities? Are they advancing to uh, higher levels uh, or more advanced uh, exercises to uh, to perform? Are they improving their functional movement? Are they able to increase range of motion? Are they able to uh, take more steps during the day? All of these things can tell the person kind of, are they making the progress that they should be? How do they compare to other people that are going through the same thing as them? Uh, and that can help kind of overall guide that person back to a full, uh, full recovery and more, uh, be more functional. All right. Okay. Well, thank you, Manish. Those are all the questions that we had prepared for you. Uh, if anyone who is uh, just listening by has a question, uh, please drop it again in that Q&A box that you should see at the bottom of your screen, and we will be getting through those at the end. But uh, now it's time for Karen Thomas. So uh, thank you, Karen. I, I've seen you in the gallery view waiting patiently. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I'm definitely eager to chat with you. And uh, yeah, I know that Karen uh, is going to have a very interesting perspective. So once again, Karen is the Director of Case Management Innovation at Corvell Corporation. And yeah, we're very excited to have you. So uh, just jumping into it, Karen, uh, I'm sure you've seen uh, quite a lot of changes since COVID-19. And uh, since COVID-19, what specific behavioral shifts have you seen in the way that employers are thinking or beginning to think about employee health? Yeah, and it's it's been massive um, at warp speed. So, you know, previous to the pandemic, employers were laser focused on the particular injury or illness um, that was addressed in the claim. And what we're seeing now is a, a much broader mindset. So understanding how important holistic health is. Um, so really employers are beginning to understand the impact of mental health issues. Um, overall good health, nutrition, rest, um, mindset. And they're eager now for information on how to promote overall employee health. So those of us in the clinician space and workers' compensation are, you know, very happy this day has arrived because we certainly understand the importance of all of these things. Um, it's interesting, COVID, the COVID virus has almost an emotional component to it. So uh, that anxiety that comes along with it, and certainly for those um, essential workers that are out there, we're already seeing the impact of 
this anxiety come through uh, with post-traumatic stress disorder, and that's only going to increase in the days ahead. So a real commitment by employers to begin to address overall health and employees. And then the other thing we're seeing, um, no surprise to anyone on this call, uh, is an interest and a commitment to telehealth. So we were already um, very active in the telemedicine space, um, but employers are very eager to be able to provide care on these virtual platforms. Um, so we've seen incredible growth with virtual physical therapy. Um, our nurses are engaged in video chats now, performing assessments, and obviously uh, physician visits on the telemedicine platform. Right, absolutely. And I think that you touched on quite a few important things there, but in promoting overall employee health and uh, really leaning into the telehealth component, I guess, how can you answer maybe what does innovation in the workers' compensation space mean to you today? Right. Um, so I think in order to talk about innovation, you first need to understand uh, where where we come from so to be new we have to come from the old right so in the workers compensation space um, claim people were very um, married to the idea of denying so um, all about containing costs by denying and we've seen a real shift you know even before of course covid in uh, beginning to understand we meet with best success um, when we acknowledge what the issues are so um, you know when we understand again the impact of overall health um, and mental well-being because we know that with injured workers ill workers um, they also experience uh, a very high incidence of anxiety and depression. And oftentimes that comes from isolation. So the minute that you're injured on the job and you are taken out of the workplace, um, it can be a very challenging time uh, because you're not, you don't have that support. You're not able to define yourself from a, a productivity standpoint. So when we begin to think about a new approach and innovating the way we approach work injuries, um, what we're doing, uh, again, not to beat the dead horse, but we're opening up for our clinicians the ability to address all facets um, of the work injuries. So that means body, mind, soul. Um, and we're seeing a, an embrace, an embracing of our medical model at Corvell by employers, by customers to address those issues and be proactive in that space. Um, from a uh, claim standpoint, we're building intelligence into our system. So we're actually getting inside of nurse physician mindset, how they kind of think and identify issues before they become issues. And we're building that kind of codification into our systems so that we can alert uh, claim professionals, hey, there is trouble on the horizon, and here's what you need to do to begin to head that off and ensure that you are um, meeting with best success to restore function with this injured worker. Um, and then with employers and customers in terms of innovation, we are looking for ways to provide reporting and analytics and trends. Um, there's just a real hunger for that in this space. Um, so by tapping into this codification process and doing the deep dive into the analytics, we can really begin to provide um, some reporting that employers can act upon preemptively. Right, and I think you touched on a lot of the key parts of innovation that we also are thinking about at Peerwell, and uh, especially something that jumped out when you mentioned treating the whole patient, like the mind, the body, the soul of the patient. So I think that, that that's crucial. And in, in thinking that way, why was now the time for Corvell to invest in remote care technology to really support your injured workers uh, in their recoveries from home? 
Yeah, so we saw the future um, a number of years ago, and um, we actually have been providing care in this virtual space um, for quite some time. So 12 years ago, we began a uh, triage platform. Um, so this is a platform where injured workers call in to nurses um, and they either treat with first aid instruction or send them on to either brick and, brick and mortar or telemedicine. Um, our nurses actually used video feeds to assess lacerations, burns, um, and really use that technology to be able to um, address appropriate levels of care. Um, I mentioned virtual physical therapy. We can offer that in 45 states. So Manish made a great point that um, this has been around for quite some time, but what's happened is we've gone from kind of 45 miles an hour to 120 <laughs> in the matter of weeks. Um, we struggled with um, kind of adoption and acceptance of this platform. Um, and so what we're seeing is now is the time. Certainly you've heard that telehealth, telemedicine, their time has arrived with this pandemic. And we can now offer um, virtual visits um, where employers, um, patients are very accepting of this. They, they want to be safe. They don't want to go sit in waiting rooms and be exposed to viruses. Um, the, the privacy, there, there's been big um, embracing of that. So telemedicine is able, you know, that enables us to provide care in a very secure private fashion. And that really resonates um, with millennials beginning to really resonate with boomers as well. Um, so this is why uh, now is the time and, and we've just seen a tremendous amount of excitement adoption. It certainly is going to change how we provide health, um, not just in the workers' compensation space, but, but to everyone across the board. Great. And I think that this next question, you've peppered some of the answer uh, throughout your discussion. But why do you think at-home remote healthcare technologies like PeerWell and other digital solutions are so important for injured workers, not just today, but going forward. Right, so this is what I just love about PeerWell, and not, not to gush, um, but um, <laughs> Manish talked about that proactive approach. So it just completely changes the mindset of the patient. And certainly as a nurse, um, I know uh, what an impact it makes on patient outcome when you are embracing that idea that, hey, um, I have an active responsibility here in my own health. So when you go to a doctor's office and you wait in the waiting room and the doctor comes in and says, okay, Karen, here's what you're gonna do. And then I leave for six weeks and I wait. Um, that just isn't the most effective model. And now we're, we're just completely changing the mindset here. Um, and uh, I, I can't contain my excitement about this because again, um, to get the buy-in from the patient and understand there are things that I can be doing um, to better my health, prepare myself for surgery. Turns out, you know, eating endless sourdough really doesn't do me in the right way here. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I need to, I need to dial that back a little bit. And with the help of um, ongoing telehealth, whether it's through the apps or through virtual visits, I begin to understand as a patient that I can affect change. And that, that is just super, super powerful. Um, the availability of care. So, you know, we struggle across the country with certain specialists being available, dermatologists, um, uh, psychiatrists, psychologists, counselors, and telehealth just opens up the availability. Um, I, I can be in Pennsylvania and tap into maybe somebody, you know, with the support of the regs and the licensing, but, but I, I can be able to complete these visits seamlessly and easily. 
totally. And uh, yeah, I couldn't agree more. So I, I think that uh, just lastly, before we open it up to the floor, uh, my final question is, how much does telemedicine and remote care play in your overall strategy for getting injured workers back to work faster and managing their care kind of from now forward? Oh, yeah. So it is our strategy. So the, the, the future is here. It's, you know, it's now. Um, and I, 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 when I talk to people about telehealth, telemedicine, I think it's important to point out that, um, you know, this is one tool available. Um, and we definitely want it to be part of the overall strategy to promote good health. Um, so we understand that it's not going to replace um, every practitioner interaction. Um, humans do need touch. Um, clinicians need to sometimes lay hands. That's very important. Um, but as we incorporate telehealth into our practice, um, it just enables us to open up our world as clinicians and make best use of time and resource. Um, part of our strategy also is to ensure that we are creating highly individualized approaches in our plans of care to patients. So the telehealth um, options just give us even more uh, potential and tools in our arsenal to restore function and promote overall good health. Great. Well, thank you so much, Karen. Uh, that was really informative. Uh, I think that hopefully everyone got something out of that. And yes, now I would like to uh, turn it to the floor and uh, ask uh, some of our audience questions. So I do see a couple that have come through. Uh, if the Q&A function, if anyone is having trouble with that, feel free to also use the chat function. I've seen a couple of questions come through that way. So either or work for us. So uh, the first question that I have seen come through is what has been the financial return on the investment? So I'm going to assume that this means investing in digital health or Peerwell specifically. Uh, I don't know if either of you want to answer that or both of you, but that is our first question. Oh, I'm happy to start. Uh, great. I think uh, it'd be great to hear from, from Karen as far as the Absolutely. Uh, range of solutions that you've put in place. But uh, when, what we've seen across the board with musculoskeletal patients in general, there's a, there's a large variety of areas where remote care tele, telehealth technologies can have an impact to create savings for the underwriters. That could be their employer, it could be their, uh, their carrier. And we've seen um, in the kind of surgery setting uh, a reduction in the time that people spend in the hospital uh, a reduction in the places where people go uh, post discharge, places like skilled nursing and and place and other uh, kind of post acute facilities like that, which especially right now is is uh, is really important, um, and reductions in use of home health aids for people that are now recovering post operatively, uh, and then in uh, other settings we've seen across the kind of post acute period a reduction in use of outpatient physical therapy. Uh, that's, been, that's been a dramatic change. A lot of people are able to recover uh, significantly better from home without any other um, uh, individuals. So uh, that, that's all kind of uh, evidence that we've been collecting as far as changes in outcome from adoption of these technologies. And the ROI on on those things uh, can be significant. Uh, we've seen between $1,800 and uh, $3,000 per patient in savings uh, when looking at surgical episodes. And surgical episodes, I think, as we know, in, uh, in healthcare are much more expensive. They're just higher, higher cost um, uh, as, they, uh, as patients go through the full scope of treatment. Yeah, and so in the uh, workers' compensation space, um, certainly as we're utilizing these video platforms with nurse connection, um, with physician connection, um, we're able to um, kind of accelerate appropriately care. So we see a decrease in uh, claim length. 
which leads to a decrease in claim cost. Um, one kind of surprising outcome that we've discovered by beginning with that nurse engagement in telemedicine on at, at the very initial stages of work injury is a decrease in litigation. So when you connect people immediately, um, it turns out they're happier people. So, and that's a great thing. Um, you know, we're meeting their needs, we're, we're connecting. Um, you might think about perhaps someone who gets injured in a very remote area, um, perhaps a trucker after hours. Um, so to put them face to face with a with a uh, telemedicine provider immediately. Um, again, the the return on investment downstream is tremendous. We also see uh, decreased need for physical therapy visits when we're completing them virtually. Um, we see decreased pharmacy spend when we are using uh, the, the apps and addressing, as I mentioned, the, the holistic needs of our injured people. Um, so those are just some examples of how we're seeing the return on investment with using these tele, telehealth platforms. Awesome. Thank you for that. I am seeing a couple more questions come in. Uh, so next up is how long does it take to implement a new telemedicine solution like Peerwell? So again, I think both of you can probably uh, touch on this from experience. Uh, Manish, do you want to answer that first? Uh, yeah, I think that's the, uh, the exciting thing about being able to leverage the existing devices that people already own. Uh, because in that way, we don't have to uh, do much to get a new program up and running. People can be uh, immediately uh, introduced to Peerwell by a nurse case manager uh, when it becomes like eligible or necessary for that person. And then right then and there, the person can sign up and, and be started on a, on a program that's uh, specific to them. So from an implementation standpoint, uh, it's it's actually pretty turnkey at, at this point where we can get injured workers immediately started on programs that are relevant to them. And I think especially now when people are stuck at home, unable to go in for regular visits, immediacy is really important, right? That person is in pain right then and there. And the longer they're kind of struggling in pain, the more uh, difficult it becomes for the injured worker and just for the whole um, uh, process to to unfold. So uh, being able to get them directly access to something that will help them recover and get them started on a program is, is what we think about. How can we make that feel uh, immediate? Yeah, Peerwell has these wonderful people that have customer success in their job titles. So manager of customer success, um, VP of customer, and you'll have to correct me, <laughs> Grace and Manish, if I'm wrong, but <laughs> I mean, just uh, the positivity in that um, is, is just tremendous. And I, I, I have I have not been paid by Peerwell to say this, but our experience at Corval has been tremendous. Um, I'm a big believer in the KISS principle, um, and the team at Peerwell really thinks and anticipates uh, the implementation every step of the way. Um, it's, it's very straightforward, very easy. Um, the marketing materials have all been thought through. Um, kickoff calls, training makes it very, very easy to get this up and running in in an incredibly short amount of time. So I, I can't say enough positive about it. We wanted to call them superheroes, but uh, we kind of chose uh, customer success. Uh, but they're superheroes to me. No, I I couldn't agree more. <laughs> Thank you for the kind words, Karen. That's very nice. Um, uh, we do have another question, and that is, how do I get PureWell? Do I contact my surgeon, my company, mm -hmm. etc.? cetera? Uh, that's a good question. So uh, in typical arrangements, there's uh, somebody that's introducing you to PureWell when they notice that you're eligible or in need of it. And that could be uh, a nurse case manager that's... Uh, assigned to your case uh, as, as a part of an injured 
uh, an injury that happened at work. It could be a nurse navigator that works uh, on your provider's team to help introduce you to our prehab program. Uh, and there's some options for people to, uh, to get onto the PeerWell program directly, um, but those are more limited forms. So if you want access or if you need access, you can, you can also email us anytime and we're happy to, to help you find the best way to get uh, to get to it. Yep, and I'm seeing another one, which is how do Corvell Corp and Peerwell work together? So I don't know if either of you want to talk about the partnership or maybe Karen. Well, Karen sure. I'll, yeah, I'll start. Um, so we have partnered with Peerwell uh, to offer the Peerwell app to injured workers. Um, and again, this is uh, a tool that our nurse case managers um, are going to oversee uh, and work with injured workers. So we are offering it to our customers um, and the nurses are the ones that refer the injured uh, worker into the app and then they are monitoring um, engagement, compliance, and then supplementing with education um, to the PeerWell app. That sounds um, pretty comprehensive to me. I mean, ultimately <laughs> what, we're, what we're solving for is how can we allow the injured workers and their uh, nurse case manager counterparts have substantive, healthy conversations to, to ensure that that injured worker is getting through recovery as quickly as possible. Because that's, that's ultimately what our mission is about. How do we help this person that's struggling in pain uh, to get through it as quickly as possible so they can get back to their normal lives? Right, and I think it's important also to understand that um, the Peerwell app is, is not meant to replace um, physician care, physical therapy, um, it's there to supplement and, and again to really promote this proactive approach to patient health. Um, so particularly in the, the time of the COVID pandemic, while so many um, states, local areas are putting elective surgeries on hold, we are seeing so many injured workers, patients waiting, waiting for surgery. Um, and, you know, to your point, Manish, they're in pain. Um, and what can we be doing to help them through this period so that complications don't develop? Mm -hmm. um, they don't begin to um, try to mitigate pain in ways that are unhealthy. Um, so that's where the PeerWell app comes in um, and makes really good use of, of the so-called wait times. So by the time surgery happens, and it will happen eventually, we've got people that are fighting fit um, and ready to go for these procedures and are going to realize great outcomes on the other side. Well said. <laughs> Absolutely. And I did get a question via chat. And uh, the question is, if it weren't for COVID, when do you both think providers and TPAs would be really starting to think about remote care for their injured workers from home? So kind of how far behind uh, would we have been had this pandemic sort of not um, sped things up? I'll let Karen take that one. Okay, fair enough. Um, I, I think, you know, I mentioned that we have been in this space for a number of years, um, but the, the adoption and the embracing of it was just kind of meandering along. Now, in certain um, industries, it was picking up pace, certainly. Um, but I, I think we would have kind of continued to plot along, certainly from a uh, legislative licensing perspective, that has been a painful process for sure. And that was has been one silver lining with COVID um, that we've seen states quickly adopt the ability for um, telemedicine to pick up speed and allow practitioners to um, be able to provide care outside their jurisdiction. Same in the nursing space, certainly. So uh, certainly COVID has helped us. Um, I think without COVID, we would have continued um, 
moving towards telehealth, telemedicine, but at a really painful, slow pace. That's what I was going to say as well. Uh, the limiting factor in the growth of use of telemedicine has been mostly around regulation and the limited ability for providers to practice in this way. And that's at the state level with the insurance commissions, but also at the federal level with Medicare and um, how they regulate what, what and how providers can practice. So uh, that's seen a big, big shift. I do think that those regulations were eventually going to, uh, to open up. Uh, we did yes. see some changes prior to COVID, especially around remote monitoring and, um, and allowing providers, especially for chronic disease management, to, to leverage uh, technology for, for better care. Uh, so there was some precedent starting to to take place, but even then, uh, like remote monitoring, that one regulation change uh, kicked off in 2019, and we've seen very slow adoption of it. Uh, right. It's completely shifted uh, in this the last two months. Uh, we've seen a dramatic, dramatic change in, in that. So uh, I would say we're probably accelerated by um, maybe five to 10 years. Um, I uh, think so. That's probably fair. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. We, we brought up virtual PT. Um, I, I want to say we started with just a handful of states. We're now up to 45 and I would say probably 75% of those states happened in a matter um, of weeks, 10 mm -hmm. days. Um, yeah. And and to reassure everyone, you know, very very safely. Um, so certainly practitioners are still held um, from a licensing perspective uh, to safe quality care. Mm -hmm. It's just mm -hmm. freeing up that jurisdictional type regulation red tape that exactly. has created the growth. Totally. Okay, I can see we have a couple more questions here and we probably have time to answer one or two more. So uh, the next question is, what kind of feedback have you seen from injured workers that have recovered using PeerWell? And what about feedback from the employers? So the, you want to start? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the feedback that we've, we've heard directly from injured workers is that it's made a dramatic impact on their ability to return to function and to have more support to get to that point, right? And in conjunction with uh, a case manager that's helping them kind of get through this process. Uh, and that's what I think is most um, uh, heartwarming for us is that this, uh, or Peerwell's ability to guide a patient from before surgery through post-op recovery and to make it feel like a known thing. Because right now, or in standard of care, when somebody is going through the uh, something as, as significant as a surgery, uh, and mind you, there is no such thing as minor surgery. Uh, for most patients, it's a scary, scary thing. And there's not a lot done to, to help that person prepare fully from that, uh, for that event. And for a lot of people, this is a, a life, first time in their lives event. So uh, being able to guide them in a daily way to help kind of quell some of that anxiety, build confidence in that person so that they feel more comfortable about what's about to happen to them uh, and what they need to do to recover fully. Uh, that's certainly well received. Uh, and we hear reports back from patients all the time, uh, how before Peerwell, they were catastrophizing the idea of having to have surgery. And for injured workers, the question, is, question always remains like, if I have surgery, am I going to be better? What if something goes wrong? Am I, am I going to be able to return to work? Am I going to be disabled for the rest of my life? Like, these are real questions that people are facing. Uh, and so being able to guide that person in uh, friendly, simple ways and to guide them through evidence-based activities that will help them have a better recovery, that's, uh, that's something that the injured workers have uh, have responded to very well. Uh, and on the employer side, uh, speaking to employers directly, um, there's, a, there's an interest in, on their side to want to provide better care for their employees. These are their uh, largest asset in their organizations, right? Having built 
companies uh, over the last 15 plus years, I know that no matter what investments I make on technology or other things, my number one asset in the company is my employee. And if they're injured or they're fit, facing an injury, how can I help that person get back to themselves and get back to being a productive individual? Because not only will that be great for that employee, it'll be great for my business. So uh, being able to provide uh, comprehensive support to injured workers, to employees, to help them get back to uh, full functioning and back to productive levels is, is really important. And there's other downstream costs that are saved uh, as a result of getting people back to work faster. You don't have to uh, worry about replace, like finding replacements for that person uh, or the, the added risks of the coworkers having to pick up for that person that's now uh, out of the workplace. Uh, those things are also on their minds uh, when it comes to instituting programs like this. So from the employer's perspective, it's not just about uh, saving money and um, kind of reducing medical spend. It's about how can they support their employee through this hard time and get them back to uh, being a productive uh, uh, coworker again. Very well said. I, the, the only thing I might add from an employer perspective is um, you just can't discount the impact of being isolated. Um, you know, and that's never intentional, but of course employers have to carry on and employees want to know they're valued and, and people are thinking about them. And, um, and when they don't feel that, we start to see the train leave the track. Mm -hmm. um, so using the PeerWell app, um, there's comfort for the employer knowing that that employee is engaging actively in their restoration of function, their recovery. Um, there's engagement by the employee. The employee is buying into, again, their, their responsibility here, um, their participation. And we've seen just uh, real positivity both on from the employee and from the employer when they engage with, with the PeerWell app. Absolutely, and I think we do have a couple more questions, but unfortunately we don't have time uh, to get through them all. So uh, please, uh, you can see Manisha's email is here on this last slide. So uh, definitely don't hesitate to reach out with any follow-up questions or comments. Uh, we do hope that uh, all of our attendees really enjoyed the conversation today. I know I did and uh, the hour flew by for me, so I hope it did for all of you. And uh, yeah, once again, thank you so much for spending your afternoon with us and I will be in touch via email with uh, a copy of today's presentation. So uh, thanks again and happy Wednesday, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, thanks everyone so for much, joining Karen. us. And thank you, thank Karen, you. for your time. It's been really, uh, really Well, thanks wonderful. for having me. Pleasure. You're the best. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs>